Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Okay. Hi. Uh, okay. Mm, so um, I wanted to tell one more thing about the installation of the software. Um, most of you got it. I mean, um, it was installed fine. Right, except those who have the Mac, uh, like the operating system. Quick question though. Mm -hmm. um, so I downloaded the software, but why do I need the VPN? If technically like I have the software, like I don't need remote access, right? VPN actually, the license file resides somewhere in DCNJ server. Oh, uh, okay. So um, that's why. Okay. That's why we need VPN and we, need to address that port like 6200. Okay, so once I use the VPN, then I'll open up the whole uh, software, I guess. Okay, no, okay. one minute, I'll show you. Okay. Um, Showing you one minute. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so when you will install the software, this should appear, right? Altair Fico. Yeah. Okay, so when you click on C, right? Like the CAD Fico, Post Fico, we will talk about that later. But when you will click on C, you will see, if it is uh, rightly installed, you will see this kind of a window. Like it will pop up like MATLAB does. Okay. And if it is not popping up, it is give, if it is giving you some license error, so it means that either you don't have VPN or either you don't did not have uh, like check your environment variables. Okay. So once this appear, you click on C and this should appear like the slide number four. Is it clear? Yes. Okay. Okay, let me start. So this is today's lecture we're going to start. So can you see my slides? Okay. So um, this is lecture number two and we're gonna a little bit talk about um, what, should, what you should say, like the background theory of EM. So we need to know that how we generate EM waves, okay? So it starts from Gauss law. I don't know you hear, heard it from physics or not, but it starts from Gauss law. And Gauss law suggests that, um, so the Gauss law is for two things, like it is for electric flux and it is also for magnetic um, flux, okay? So for ignet, uh, electric flux, it states that the net electric flux. So what is electric flux? Electric flux is actually the electric lines or electric field created due to some electric field or uh, electric density, okay? So what it says that if you have a closed surface, like this is a closed surface, 
if you have a closed surface like that, then your net electric flux, like the field uh, due to um, coming out of the closed surface is actually equal to the charge enclosed in that surface, multiply one by epsilon naught. So one by epsilon naught is something that is constant. Okay, it depends upon the material property. But uh, electric flux, it says, or the electric lines or the field due to uh, like the coming, that coming out from that surface, it's due to the charge that is enclosed in that surface. Okay. And if, so this is uh, for the positive charge, if you have negative charge, it's uh, acting as a sink, like the uh, electric lines will be coming towards the surface. But you can see that uh, if there is a charge enclosed it, the, all the electric lines that are coming out of the surface should be, in, should be equal to the Q that is enclosed in the surface, okay? Does this make sense? I mean, it's just a visual, visualization. Like we want to visualize that um, this is a closed surface. And uh, like in this closed surface, we are seeing some like the electric field around it, okay? So we are saying that if there is a closed surface and there is electric field around, around it, then it is equal to the charge that is enclosed in that surface, like the Q that is enclosed in that surface. Okay? Okay. So now there is a Gauss law for magnetism too. What it says, so, so the Gauss law for magnetism is saying that it, that it is not same like the field due to the magnetic field, like the magnetic field is not same like electric field. It's just not that you will see some electric field lines coming out of that surface, okay? They said that magnetic field cannot act as a separate charge, like electric field acts as separate positive charge and negative charge. You can separate them, you can analyze them. But for magnetic field, they said that if there is a North Pole, there must be the South Pole. Okay, so you will always see a closed loop field. Like here you are seeing a closed loop field, right? So they are saying that even you take a smallest piece of magnet, it, it cannot act like this, okay? Even the smallest piece of magnet automatically develops North and South Pole, right? So which says that there will always be the field that will start and end on itself, okay? So there is no single charge, like there is no positive charge, there is no negative charge. Am I right? Am I like, am I clear about that? Can you say that one more time, the last part? I was just writing it down on it. Yeah, it's fine. What I'm saying is, I'm also recording the lecture. I will post maybe on YouTube. So maybe it helps, okay? I'll share my channel too, okay? So, okay, what I'm saying is, you can see what is the difference between electric flux and magnetic flux. The difference is, that electric flux has a monocharge, like it, we can analyze a positive charge and we can analyze a negative charge, right? So you can see the field lines that are coming out of it. But for magnetic flux, you do not have a single charge. You have North Pole, you have South Pole, and when the electric field line starts from somewhere, they will always end. So it, they will always form a closed loop like this. Okay, and due to that, 
purpose because they always have both charges in them. So the total electric flux or total uh, field lines that are coming out of it is always zero because whatever starts from there will end it. Okay, sounds good? Am I clear about these two things? Uh, just repeat it. You said, so the total electric flux in one of those closed loops is zero? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I hope that uh, those who have, uh, you, who are taking EM and those who have taken EM, they, um, uh, they maybe they learned or maybe learning details of this more, okay? But I'm just introducing it uh, for the purpose to make our basis. So we want to know what we, uh, to the extent what we want to know, okay? We don't want to go in details for now, okay? But we want to visualize a Gauss law in terms of electric flux and magnetic flux that makes sense for us, okay? So it does like make sense? Yeah, okay. Okay, so what we said, there is a closed surface and electric field lines coming out of it. And it, was, it will be equal to the charge enclosed in that surface. And the other thing we are saying is that if it is a magnetic, you know, Magnetic monopole cannot exist if there is a magnet or anything that causes the magnetic field. The magnetic field lines will always start from it and end it and end and, and on it. So they will not be something like this, but there will always be some closed loops. Okay. Okay, so we will move forward. Now this is the Faraday law. Okay. So in the Faraday law, the time comes like that the variance comes. So what Faraday law is saying, it's saying that this is a coil, right? So if there is any change in the coil environment or the magnetic environment of the coil, it will cause EMF. EMF is electromotive force, or you can also call, the, like you can see a voltage meter here, right? Which means that you have a coil, you have connect, it, it is not connected to any source, right? But you are connecting it to voltmeter. And if you move magnet in it like this, so you are changing its magnetic field because you can see that there is a magnetic field around the magnet, right? So when you move it like this, its magnetic field will vary and that is causing an electric field that you can measure, change in electric field that you can measure, right? So what we are saying is that change in magnetic field is actually producing a change in electric field. Are we clear about this? Okay, so what we are saying here is that one more time, if we like imagine this, this thing that there's a coil and we are moving magnet inside it. It may be all sorts of example, but this is the simplest one. So you are actually changing the magnetic field around the magnet and the coil both, right? But you are measuring the EMF or the voltage source. Oh, so not source, voltage 
across the coil by connecting the voltmeter across it. And you will see the change in the voltmeter that shows that the change in magnetic environment is creating a voltage, right? Okay, that's interesting. Then now using Faraday's law, we are making connections between magnetic and electric field. Let's see. Now this is an Ampere's law, okay? So what Ampere's law is saying, let's see. Okay, so I just want to discuss what this like the um, picture is showing. So you are seeing that there are uh, there is some uh, electric uh, elec like electric charge or electric current is flowing in this wire, right? And if you have some board like this and put some magnetic like the um, what you should say like the particles on it, you will see that they will arrange themselves. You are putting some random random particles and they are arranging themselves in form of loops. So it means that there is some kind of magnetic field around it, right? So that's for, for the first time was deducted, detected by Ampere. Ampere was a scientist. And what he said is that if you have a wire in which the current is flowing, right? And you draw a closed path around this wire so the sum of the length of elements uh, will like the uh, like the line integral of these um, magnetic field will be equal to the current flowing in the wire. Um, so I have a question about this. Yeah. Um, so like like the illustration like it shows like a battery um, which is like direct current, does this differ at all for like alternating current or does it stay the same? No, right now, yeah, that's a very, very good question. We will address that. What okay. we are saying is that right now there's a steady current, but what, but what we just say, say is that if there is a, even the steady current, there's some sort of magnetic field around it, right? Yep. Okay, so and this is a steady current. That's a good point that this is a DC current and what will happen if we have a changing current, right? But, but, but I'm just trying to establish that if you have the current that is flowing in the wire, you will have a magnetic field around a closed path and the integral line integral of that closed path multiplied by the magnetic flux will be equal to the total current that is flowing in the wire. Sounds good? Okay. So Maxwell said that there is some sort of uh, miss, um, missing part in Ampere's law, right? So he said that we should tackle the steady current and we should also tackle the time varying current. Okay? So that's what he does. He actually introduce another quantity that tackles the time varying current um, in that formula. So he said that if there is a current which is time varying or if there is a current which is steady, they both can generate a closed loop around uh, the wire or the source that is creating the time wire current and that will be equal to their magnetic field. Okay. So where phi is the flux due to electric field and it is time varying. So now if we stop for a minute and we think about this, we actually see four laws that relates magnetic field to the electric field, right? One law, first law was Gauss law and he just did not find a relationship between them, but he 
find that there is an electric flux that is different from magnetic flux, right? Then we say, okay, then we start finding a relationship between Farad, like we saw Faraday law, which is trying to find the relationship between electric field and magnetic field. And then we saw Ampere's law that is also was the vice versa of Ferrari law. When they discovered these laws, they didn't know that they will uh, be coming together somehow, right? So, so these are just different sources of um, magnetic field. So I, we know that the obvious sources of magnetic field is the magnet, but it's very interesting to know that magnetic field can be produced around a current. It could be produced around the loop of wire. There is a magnetic field around earth and there is magnetic field around solenoid. So like where there is an electric field, there is also a magnetic field. Okay, that's very, that was very interesting discovery at that time. Okay. So what I was trying to say that we are summarizing these four laws. Okay. So Gauss is saying how Q produces E, E lines begin and end on Q, Qs. So um, they can begin and they can end. But Gauss for B is saying there is no magnetic type monopoles and you will have B lines from the loops, like they will end, start and end in it. Ferrari is saying changing magnetic flux gives electromotive force, electromotive force, that is the electric voltage. And Ampere say, we did not include Ampere's Maxwell, but it's the same, like moving charges produce B, right? So in other words, if we just see them again, we are saying that changing electric field is producing magnetic field and changing magnetic field is producing electric field, right? They are interchangeable. Am I clear about that? Yeah. Okay. So once we establish this in our mind, okay, now we are good. So if this is wearing, this will produce, this is wearing, this will produce. Now we should talk about EM wave. I think we are ready to sink that in, okay? So now what this is, this is an EM wave and in which you have something that is wearing, like maybe the charge that is wearing, but it is, so it's interchangeable. If there is an electric field that is produced, there is a uh, perpendicular magnetic field that is produced due to that. And they both will uh, move forward as a wave front, like as they are um, moving forward together, right, with time. So that's how, uh, so what is happening? You are seeing electric field, you are seeing magnetic field. Then uh, at next time you are seeing electric field, you are ma seeing magnetic field. So they are moving forward as total wave front. So their energy is kind of moving forward because they are producing each other, okay? But right now we need to know that how they will be produced. Like this is the EM wave we know uh, that is producing due to like the variance in each other, but what are the sources, how they will pre be produced, we will know that. But that's why like the main question was how it works. It works because they produce each other, right? Are we clear about this? Am I fast? Fabian, what do you think? Am I fast? 
Oh, I think you're doing well. <laughs> okay, thank you. So just uh, stop me and let me know if you think that I'm being too fast. Okay, so now still uh, now till now we establish a point. Okay, now let's move forward. That's what our question is. Like the first question is, how is radiation accomplished? We know there are there are EM waves. In other words, how are the electromagnetic fields generated by the source, contained and guiding guided within this transmission line and antenna, and finally detached from the antenna to form a free space, right? So we have these two questions. First question is that how is it possible that we have uh, some material that can do radiations like that can produce EM waves? The second question is that how it is possible that we have a medium that has the a uh, wave passing through it and suddenly we detach it from that and it, it acts as like as an antenna in the free space waves, right? So these are the two important questions we will address in this lecture. So first, uh, this is the simplest um, conceptual diagram of some uh, device that is generating what you should say, EM wave. So th if this is a source, you know that if there are two wires uh, in which this um, current is flowing, they will have electric field between them. So this electric field is kind of uh, alternating. That's why you are seeing different sides like the direction of arrows here, right? So you are seeing that uh, it's alternating like this. So sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. So this is electric field that is going in the transmission line. And now it, as, as you are changing the uh, structure of the wires or whatever, like the conductor this is, it's kind of acting like an antenna, right? So these fields are trying to um, and start and end, start and end. And eventually when they didn't find um, structure, they act like an antenna. How it behaves, I actually, I think uh, mentioned in the design block too, that if you see this thing, you are seeing that let's say there is a positive charge. It's like the field starts from it. It always trying to find its negative charge. So similarly, if there is a positive charge, it's always trying to find its negative charge where it ends. But once they are in the free space, they don't find their, um, what you should say, negative charge. So they extend, extend, extend until the infinity. And it looks like that they are forming something like this, a loop um, of the, of the, charges because we are assuming that they will find some charge somewhere around and it looks like that they are generating some energy. Okay, so that's how due to the alternating current, we are, think, we are saying that they are producing waves. Okay, we will elaborate this uh, picture more. But for now, this is our explanation that we are saying how the radiation mechanism is happening. Are we clear about this? Bryce, what do you think? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Any confusion we have? Hey, Professor, do you also uh, post the lectures on Canvas afterwards too? Yes, yes, I will. Okay, thank you. I think I posted the last one too.
just check in, under the files. Okay. Okay, so we are good about this. Okay. This now I am doing the equivalent Thavenin circuit of the antenna. Okay, we want to explain it uh, in terms of electric circuits as well. So what we are saying here is that if we draw an equivalent circuit of antenna, we are saying that we can uh, define a source, like we can um, formulate source as this uh, um, voltage source with the resistance. That is the source resistance or generator impedance, okay? And then there is a transmission line between them. And then there is an antenna that is creating a conduction and dielectric losses. And then there is a radiation resistance. And then there is an imaginary reactance. So what we are trying to say is that we have a transmission line. We have the impedance due to antenna. And then we are having a impedance due to the source. So this is kind of the equivalent circuit we are drawing. So we are saying an energy generated by the source should be totally transferred to the radiation resistance um, for the emission or for the radiation, okay? Not, however, it normally in practical environment does not happen. What happens is that when you generate, like when the source is generating an alternating uh, voltage or there is an alternating current, there are always losses. There are some losses here. There are um, conduction and dielectric losses, RL, and which there are mismatch losses. Like mismatch losses means that uh, you have some impedance here, let's say, um, 50 ohms, but this impedance is not equals to 50 ohms. So that is mismatch. So that's for that reason, it causes a reflection of energy, somehow, somewhat reflection of energy, and that is causing a reflection or mismatch losses in that. So uh, did you, do you remember that we have learned maximum power transfer theorem in the electric circuit cycling, right? So maximum power transfer theorem states that maximum power transfer is possible if your ZG, like the, uh, like the source uh, impedance is equal to your um, load impedance, right? So what it means is that if this ZG is defined as RG plus XG, RG should be equal to this uh, resistance and XG should be equal to minus XA. If I write it, um, what I'm trying to say is if this is ZG, which is equal to the RG, plus XG, it should be equal to RG is equal to RL plus RR. Okay, sorry, RR. So this is RR and XG is equal to minus XA. So there should be minus here. Okay, so then you will have maximum power transfer.
Okay. Sounds good. So that's what we were saying here. Maximum power is delivered to antenna. We of course want that we transfer maximum power and we have maximum efficiency. We have less losses. So that's, that's the design consideration of antenna. And that comes from the understanding of our equivalent circuit that we want to have um, a maximum power transfer towards the load, okay? Sounds good? Okay, so, uh, <laughs> okay, one minute. It's just uh, another form of equivalent circuit that I have drawn, I think, and it's saying the same thing, except it isn't, it's not addressing the, uh, what you should say, the conjugate part of it. Okay, so another, another thing we want to just touch uh, that, if we have some reflected waves from the load, we will see some standing waves. Standing waves are those waves that if your uh, source wave is coming and you, will see a, you are seeing a reflection, so they both will meet and do some constructive and destructive interference. And that's called some oscillating or standing waves inside. So we have this standing wave here, which we want to minimize. So we have some threshold for standing wave ratio and we say that antenna is working perfectly if we have some minimum standing waves, okay? Which shows that its reflection is minimum, okay? So if standing waves are minimum, we will say that its reflections are minimum. Okay, we are clear about this? <clears throat> we have any questions? Okay. So the big picture is, no, so this is losses and matching. Okay, one more thing is that we actually, actually uh, we have actually addressed this a little bit, but it's more that if the antenna system is not properly designed, instead of acting as a radiation device, it acts, it will start acts as an energy storage device. And if you have a really, really large standing waves, you will see some arcing inside the transmission line, which is not at all acceptable. So it's the, it's the job of antenna designer uh, or RF engineer that they try to minimize the mismatch losses and they try to um, transfer the maximum power towards the load, okay? So we want to see how we can minimize our losses. So we want to select low loss lines. We want to reduce loss resistance represented by RL, conduction and dielectric losses. We want to minimize that. And also we want to minimize standing waves. So these standing waves we can minimize by impedance matching, or we can minimize by designing an antenna in such a way that it gives us least standing waves that we have talked about in the last slide. So that's one way, um, I mean, of uh, like the, that's a one parameter of designing a good antenna. So in advanced wireless system, like the good antenna designers try to optimize or accentuate the radiation energy in some direction and suppress in others. So uh, if this is a directive antenna, like we are using now in most cases, it should target energy in one direction and it should suppress energy from others. That's how we will know that it's a directive antenna. So that's why we want to direct energy in one direction and we want to suppress energy in others. So the suppressing energy in other direction means that you will know that these, there are side lobes which we want to suppress. So in that case, if we act like that, antenna will act as a directional device, which can direct energy in some uh, particular direction. 
Okay. Okay. Ria, are we good? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so now the big picture. So what is the big picture here? So the thing is that we, we are saying that a good design of antenna can relax system requirements and improve overall system performance. And we are also saying that uh, like just a typical example is that if your TV antenna, now it's nowadays it's very less common, but it's just a example that in our times, there were antennas that are, were broadcasting uh, from the TV uh, station. So then if that antenna's reception is not good, you are not having a good performance. So if, you're, if your antenna is fine, you are of course having a good performance. Even if you, you can relate it with the mobile phones, that if they did not design antennas well, you will not have a good bandwidth, right? So nowadays there are all sorts of intelligent algorithms that can you know, optimize the performance, but still the need of a good antenna or good hardware is very, very important. So it's still there is a, a talk about ultra wideband. Why? Because it's the antenna or the hardware that is receiving. And if the, it's not working fine, if it is not receiving certain signal to noise ratio, then all the algorithm that we are running is not of no use, right? So that's why it's very important to have a good antenna. So we, we say that antenna to a communication system is like a, a glasses for a human being. So if you want to see well, and if you want to see clear and your eyes are not clear, then they act as a glasses for you. You can only see clear through your glasses. Similarly, if your antenna is good, you will be able to receive it clearly, okay? Okay, so, so this is a horn antenna and we talked about uh, equivalent resistance and um, the equivalent circuit. So we can design this equivalent circuit like that here. Let me check how much time we have. Okay, we have time, that's good. Okay. So uh, this is our horn antenna and it's uh, equivalent circuit, okay. So now uh, we will go in little bit of detail in radiation mechanism. We already did that, but we will do it more, a little bit more. So if this is a, um, a wire, you can say, or a cylinder, which has the, uh, uh, on which the current is flowing, right? And you are seeing that uh, there's a current density JZ on the cross section of the wire which is equals to the total charge and velocity of the moving charge, okay? So the current density is equal to the velocity and the, um, what you should say, a total charge. So similarly, if you have current, so if it is a, if this is a perfect electric conductor, normally in perfect electric conductor, there is charge only on the surface, okay? So that, and then in that case, they, this is the current density over the cross section or the surface of the electric conductor. And similarly, this will be uh, charge of the surface. And this is the velocity in the Z direction, if this is the Z direction for that. Now, if we assume that this is a um, thin conductor, very, very thin conductor, then instead of JZ, we can write that this uh, current is flowing on very, very thin wire. 
And we can also assume that it's so thin that you don't have to consider volume charge or you don't have to consider surface charge, but you are considering a line charge. So then in that case, your current is equal to the charge multiplied by its velocity. Now we are saying that if our current has a time varying, if our conductor has a time varying current, then in that case, this velocity will also be becoming a time varying, which makes it an acceleration, right? So in that case, your time varying current is equal to the charge multiplied by its acceleration. And that's what we are talking about that if we have a time varying current in a conductor, then it will be producing the radiation, right? So that's what uh, we are trying to establish that even in a wire, if it is a time varying current, how can we produce a radiation? So there should be a time varying scenario that can produce an acceleration, right? <clears throat> so, to create a radiation, there must be a time varying current or an acceleration or des deceleration of a charge. So if you, I, I'm just uh, like stating this, that produces radiation, it follows that di by dt produces radiation, use charges for transients and pulses, use currents for um, time harmonic variation. We will also explain this, okay? But the thing is that we are saying that to create radiation, there must be a time varying current or acceleration. Okay. So, um, it, one more thing is that if in this if in this wire um, charge is not moving, there is a static charge. There is no radiation. If charge is moving with a uniform velocity and your wire is infinite, you know, then still there is a no radiation because you are seeing a steady current in which uh, there is a uniform velocity. The, the radiation only creates due to the time varying scenario or due to some disturbance, okay? So if there is a disturbance in the current, only then you will see a radiation. So radiation produces when you have a curved wire, you have a bent, you have a discontinuous wire, or you have a terminated or truncated wire, even if you are having a steady current. So if you are having a steady current, but you are seeing some sort of scenario in which the current is disturbing, then you will be seeing a radiation. Or if you are having a time varying current in a straight wire, you will also see a radiation, okay? So what I'm trying to establish is that time varying scenario or acceleration only produces when you have some disruption in the wire, okay? Okay. So what we are trying to establish is that in this curve wire, we are seeing some radiation. In this bent wire, we are seeing some radiation. There is no radiation until here, until it sees a disruption and there will be a radiation. It's a debatable question, how much radiation is this? Will, will this be useful? We don't know yet, but we are just trying to establish that the radiation can be produced in the disruption of the wire, okay? Similarly, this is a discontinuous wire. It's, there is also radiation here. This is a terminated wire. Terminated wire means that it has a finite length which is terminated with some ZL. So there's also a radiation here, even if it's a straight wire, but this is a truncation. That's why it sees a disruption. Okay, so if we say that we have a truncated wire, so it will again act like, like a, a equivalent circuit scenario we were having. So we are saying that if we send a signal, it will also be reflected back. So there will be acceleration or deceleration of the charges that can produce a radiation, 
okay? So, okay, one more thing. I mean, we are just briefly touching here. It's not to, you know, understand everything, but we are just saying that if this pulse is very, very, very small, right? In that case, because you know by Fourier transform that time and frequencies are interchangeable scenario, right? So if, you're, if you are sending something very, very narrow in time, it will be very, very wide band in frequency. So if you are sending a narrow pulse, you will see a very large set of the frequencies here. So we will talk about it again, like in detail, but it's just an um, introduction scenario, what they are talking about here. It looks like too much of information right now. Are we good? Oh, I just had a quick question. Uh, yeah. Is there like a specific type of radiation that's created or just um, kind of RF? It's just the no, like the simple radiation. Yeah, okay. where you can see, uh, you where you can feel some field, but it may not be something that is, I think, meaningful until you design it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it's like that, um, you know, you remember, I don't know whether you have done it or not. Um, if, you, if you attach a wire to something, so you will see some sort of, you know, uh, radiation, right? Like the, like the like, um, what you should say, small wire. So people even use the small wires as an antenna too, you know? So they will say, oh, so it can, you know, transmit, or even if they want to pick a signal, they just uh, put a small wire or something and they said that, oh, they are picking a signal. It's just because that this small wire due to disruption can act as an antenna, right? But, but we need to know what should be the length, what should be, oh, at what frequency we should see these things, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question to kind of go off of that. Mm -hmm. um, so is this like basically like, let's just say like you were, you put like an antenna or like something like underneath like a power line and then you put like a multimeter to it. Like, it, would you be able to read like a tiny voltage because of some, because of this radiation? Yes. So, so um, there is ground penetrating radars. So what are, what are the ground penetrating radars do? They actually try to, when, when you go on the ground, they try to uh, see the disruptions under the ground. They want to see whether there is some, uh, you know, it's, it depends on application, but if you want to see that, is there some metal object under the ground, they just know, need to know from the radiation that it is causing, you know? And similarly, so what radars do, so uh, for radar, the other thing should not be, or may or may not be the antenna, but because radar have both transmitters and receivers. So what happens is if you have a radar and you are moving on some metal object, radar will send a signal to the metal and it will come back to the radar. And if the signal is changed through that, they will know, oh, there is some object, you know? So right. even if if something is um, if something is radiating, you can also know that it's it's there under the ground or not. Does this make sense? Yes. Okay. Anything else? We good to go. We good to move on, not go. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. So we will just skip this a little bit uh, for a little bit because I'm not going in details of this. Okay, so now we talked about um, radiation due to one wire. Now we are again 
coming back to the two wire scenario, which we have discussed before. So we said, I said it before that in the two wire scenario, you are connecting a source with the two wires and it's producing an alternating current in the wire, right? And it's actually talking about the same thing that we have discussed before, that if you have you know, alternating current in the wire, in the two wire scenario, and you suddenly truncate it somewhere and create a scenario in which these lines have to end themselves by, like, by themselves, so then in that case, they will detach from the, uh, from the guided wave. This we call as a guided uh, wave guide, or we call that we are guiding them by self, but suddenly if we truncate it and they are on their own, they try to form this kind of a loop. So free space waves are also periodic, but at a constant fa phase, they are moving outwardly with the speed of light. So um, uh, the EM waves actually moves with the speed of light. So they are trying to, they are to move their wave front because there are two uh, waves like electric waves and magnetic waves, waves. So that's why we are talking about their energy moving forward. We are talking about uh, the combination of these waves moving forward, okay? So we will talk uh, about that as well. We call this as a pointing vector but that's how they are moving. Okay, so this is another scenario you are seeing here. Uh, this is a horn um, antenna. Why it's called a horn? Because it looks like a horn, okay? And in this antenna, this is, uh, the pin is the, actually the source. You are feeding it from here and it's moving uh, so this is a wave guide or the guided wave, which is between these um, conductors and now it's going outward as the wave front. Okay. Okay. And this, these grooves, these may or may not be here. It's just the application dependent or design dependent. Maybe they are getting a good matching with these grooves. So it's all depend on antenna designer, how they design it. Okay. Okay, so a scenario of standing waves. I will just uh, touch it very, very briefly uh, because we already talked about it, but what is a standing wave that if this is wave that is going on here and due to the truncation, it comes back. So we are saying that the, this reflection will match with the trust, like the source and it will create some standing waves. Okay, so if we think about in the, uh, in the mathematical scenario, that's how you see it. So this is a traveling um, of the sinusoid, right? If it is moved in this way and after reflecting, it comes back here so at this point, you are adding them. Okay. So you know about this um, EJ scenario, like the sinusoid, or what you said it? You was one Yes. Do you know that? Yeah. Ej theta is equals to cos theta plus sine theta. Yep. Okay, plus j sine theta. Sorry. Yeah. So that's a, exactly that. So normally, when you have an oscillating um, waveform, you represent it in form of Ej, right? Because it has both cos and sine in it. Okay. And this k lambda l by two is actually the uh, what you should say the property of it. So K is we call this as a wave number. It is actually equals to two pi by lambda. We will, I mean, it's just, uh, I'm just um, getting you familiar with it, but we will go in detail as well. But I've just described what is this. So K is 
2 pi by lambda. So let, where lambda is your wavelength, okay? So here, if you just think about that, this is some oscillating wave, which is going this way and it went like that before. And after reflection, this wave is coming back here like that. Then these both wave when they join together here, they are creating some, this scenario. And this scenario can be interpreted as a sign signal. So we are saying that this standing wave is actually kind of this scenario, okay? And what they are doing here is they are writing sign X in the McLaurin series and in McLaurin series, you are saying, okay, we'll talk about it. But you just think about this thing. You say that when the standing wave join together, they create some sign, sign thing here, okay? So forget about this thing right now. But till here we are saying, this is, the, uh, this is the transmitting, this is the reflected, and when they both join together here, they are creating something like that. Okay. Okay, another like the imagining thing or the scenario is like this, that you have, um, this is a dipole antenna and you are feeding it somewhere here. And what you are trying to see is that this is an alternating current that is passing, which is creating a standing wave because it's coming back again and again because of the truncation. And in result of this, it is producing this electric field, which will in turn produce the perpendicular magnetic field in it. So it's just the reiteration of all what we have said, but we want to see in different, different forms so that we mm, register it in our mind that it is happening, okay? Because I feel that EM is just the visualization and your imagination. So if your imagination is strong and you have something in your, because you cannot see it, right? So if your imagination is strong, only then you can get the physical insight of that scenarios. Another scenario is this, that's what we are saying, that if there is a dipole or antenna it, and there is an electric field, it in turn produces the magnetic field, which it in turn produces the electric field, which in turn produces the magnetic field and so on. Okay. I think I will this skip this a moment for a moment. So if this is your, <clears throat> uh, I want to also just touch a little bit on spherical coordinates. Why? Because I know that it's difficult for some of you to understand, right? So um, are we good? Should we move on? <laughs> Let me check the time. It's still good. We good to, uh, I mean, are we good to sink in all the other previous things? Okay, so, so this is spherical coordinate, okay? So spherical coordinates, if you think, there are two interchangeable notations. Some of them, some of uh, the books, um, say this is phi, some say this is theta, okay? So it's all okay to consider that, but we will use this notation, okay? Where we will say that this is our theta and this is our phi. What it is actually, what is spherical coordinates? So you know, all of you know rectangular, rectangular coordinates, x, y, and z, right? Louis, do you know that? Yes, Eric knows. Yes. Yes. Okay. John, John Taylor, do you know that? Okay. So what is spherical coordinates? We all the time say this is R theta phi. 
But what is R theta phi? We will not go in detail of how we got it, okay? Bec but we will just want to know the physical imagination of this. So if you say that this is your R, right? And your theta is with the Z axis. In that scenario, if you drop a perpendicular here, like this way, this thing is your R cos theta, which is the image of this thing that we, they have created here. So it's just that Z is equal to R cos theta, okay? And if you have phi here, I'll just draw Z one minute. So this thing is actually R cos theta, which is the image of this thing they have created here. Okay, so this is R cos theta. And if you are drawing phi here, you're just making the relationship between them. So, and you said that this is my row, okay? Because if this is cos theta and I am completing the triangle, this will automatically become the sine theta or sine theta. And if my hypotenuse is R sine theta, my X and Y axis here will interpret as this. This, if this is rho, and also this is rho. Can we, can we see that like that? I will also describe how you can imagine it, but mathematically it's just this, um, I want to describe this as, do you have any question regarding it? How this comes and how we are interpreting it like that? Saad, are we good? Saad Ahmed? Yeah. Okay. Parker? Yeah, I think I'm good. Okay. Aaron, do you think we are good? Yeah. Okay. So that's how we uh, describe them in terms of uh, rectangular coordinates or the spherical coordinates. So if you move forward, so if this is your, so I just want to describe R theta and phi right now, okay? So if your R is fixed, right? So is this, it's just the visualization. If your R is fixed here, somewhere here, then it's act as the, your theta is also changing, your phi is also changing. So this will make a sphere for you at, at certain R, okay? Sounds good? Because if you have question, you can ask right now because they will use spherical coordinates very often, okay? So we should be very, very clear what we are looking at. So if R is fixed, what I'm saying is that if, what, what will happen if we change R here? What do you think what will happen? The size of the sphere changes. Yes, size of the sphere changes. Yes, that's right. Okay, that's very good. Okay, let's do, let's move forward. So this is when your phi is fixed, right? When you fix your phi at certain point here, like here, your, your R is changing 
your theta is changing, but your phi is fixed, right? So that is the plane you are drawing here. Am I clear about this? Okay. And this is the scenario when your theta is fixed, right? So your R is changing from here to here. Your phi is changing from here to here, but your theta is fixed like this, right? Okay. So in this scenario, what will happen if I change my phi? In this scenario, in the second figure, what will happen if I change my phi? Um, wouldn't it just look like the one all the way on the left? Yeah, if I change my phi, this plane will move to some other angle, right? Right, yeah. That's what yeah. I meant. Yeah. Yes, okay. And what happens if I change my theta in this third figure? Would there be like a bottom half? What, what it will be? Like it'll, it'll start alternating from like the bottom, like the bottom half of the sphere. Mm, for this third picture? Yeah. Yeah, it will change your uh, opening of the cone, you can say that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so right now your cone is like this. So you are making cone here. So if your theta is changing, your cone may be more narrow or maybe more wide, right? Like the opening of the cone may be changing, right? Because if you have here, theta here, your cone becoming a flat, right? Yeah. What will happen if your theta is 90? That's what actually my question is. It just become like a line in the vertical or in the vertical direction. It will become what? Like a line because the angle will collapse in on itself. Okay. Anyone else? When it oh, just like be flat on the xy plane. What it will be? Uh, like Shane said, it would be like flat on the xy plane. Yeah, um, it will become a circle, right? Like if you have something that is here, your cone will spread out in one plane, right? You see what my point is? So it will become a horizontal circle right? At here, at this point. So when your theta is 90. Am I clear about that? So when we say a circle, it, it's different from sphere. Okay. Do we have any confusion? Are we clear? Jack, are, do you think we are clear? Oh uh, yeah, I'm clear on that. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so, um, so I have some interactive questions, okay? And what I am going to do is, let me just bring them up first. Where are they? Okay. Let me open them. And I am making your breakout rooms. And you are supposed to figure them out, okay? And um, then you come back and whatever time we have left, uh, do as much as you can in two minutes and we will discuss them, okay? Mm, can you access them? I don't know. One minute, let me check.
because it's on my file, how can you access them? Or maybe should I upload them on the canvas? Just a minute. Or maybe we will do it next time, okay? In the start of next class, we will do these interactive questions, okay? And then we will start our lecture. Sounds good because it's very less time to now, right now and we may not have time. Okay, so thank you for today. There is a, there is a minute paper on the canvas. Uh, go and write down regarding today's class. Can you see that? Mm, let me check. Yeah, we can see it. Yes. yes sir. So can I go and just do it for me. Uh, no, it's, it's just a minute, just a minute. This is the old one, right? No, 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 no. This is round clause I'm looking at. So this is this should be some new minute paper. I'm just quickly. Yeah. So please fill that out for me. And um, I, I skimmed through your last minute paper. Someone said, um, I'm not at all excited about the class. <laughs> it's just totally fine. But um, but it's okay. And it's really good way of knowing your thoughts. Okay. So I am really looking forward to it. Please write it down for me and thank you for today. I hope you learned something. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend. Bye.